Good morning. Today I'm going to speak about acute kidney injury, one of very important topics in nephrology. Let me start the presentation with this virtual case. A 65-year-old gentleman who has prolonged history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension for more than 20 years. His baseline serum creatinine is 2.7 milligram per deciliter with estimated GFR based on CKD epidemiology equation about 25 milliliter per minute. This means a stage four chronic kidney disease. He presents to the emergency department with acute chest pain that was proven to be due to acute myocardial infarction and the management was primary coronary intervention understanding. Two days later, he became oligoric. Serum creatine rose from 2.7 to 4.5 milligram per deciliter with normal serum potassium, no significant metabolic acidosis, and no evident volume overload by clinical examination. I know this is a case of acute kidney injury on top of coronary kidney disease because the baseline is a stage four CKD, CKD, so it is acute kidney injury, superimposed on chronic kidney disease. But the questions, what is the etiology of acute kidney injury? Number two, what are the risk factors? How to prevent them? And if this is a case scenario, and these are the presentation and lab parameters, do you like to do the analysis now? I'm going to answer these questions at the end of this presentation. So I'm going to highlight the importance of acute kidney injury, then the current definitions, risk factor and etiology, how to diagnose, how to treat, and I'm going to end with some special situations before the conclusion. Let me to start with the importance of acute kidney injury. Is it an important disease? Yes, it is very important. Why? Because it is associated with high risk of mortality, as shown from this slide that reflects the experience through 50 years. Although there were major advancements in medicine, but acute kidney injury associated mortality is still very high, as you see by the height of the bar. This is the percentage of mortality associated with acute kidney injury. And this curve shows the number of patients you can see on this axis. So the first statement, acute kidney injury is associated with mortality. And the mortality associated with acute kidney injury even exceed the sum mortality that is associated with many diseases which are common like diabetes, heart failure, breast, and breast cancer. What are the consequences of acute kidney injury? We can expect that acute kidney injury is a recoverable disease, and we are expecting recovery. But we should prepare ourselves to assess the patient because the patient may have fluid overload, electrolyte and acid-based abnormalities, impaired innate immunity, and even the patient may develop in the future chronic kidney disease. More importantly, the patient may die. Another data uh, from the Mayo Clinic proceeding, uh, AKI in hospitalized patients. What is the impact of AKI in hospitalized patients? As you see clearly, these are the hospitalized patients without acute kidney injury, and this is with acute kidney injury. What do you see from the two curves? Acute kidney injury is associated with increased mortality. What is the link between acute kidney injury and cardiovascular outcome? I think this slide shows the link of the nephrology, either acute or chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease with the heart problems. So, uh, so long as we are speaking about acute kidney injury, so acute kidney injury is associated with reduced glomerular filtration rate, sympathetic nervous system activation, renin and angiotensin aldosterone system activation, coagulation and endothelial dysfunction, and inflammation. All these uh, factors can lead to neurohormonal activation, volume expansion, hypertension, electrolyte and acid-base imbalances, 
that ultimately will lead to cardiac problems, including heart failure and arrhythmias. Through the, the most recent article assessing acute kidney injury, absolute risk of clinical events for patients in high income countries in the year after hospitalization with acute kidney injury should uh, increase the mortality, cardiovascular events, hospital readmission, and the kidney outcome. All cause mortality, cardiovascular related mortality, cancer specific, uh, any cardiovascular events, heart failure. Uh, any uh, hospitalization uh, or AKI related rehospitalization, occurrence of chronic kidney disease, and even in decision kidney disease. As you see, this is the absolute risk percent. Event rates for long term outcomes after acute kidney injury is very nicely illustrated in this uh, article. As you see, uh, hypertension. This is the rate, 23 per, per, per 100 person per year. Cardiovascular mortality, 2.96 per 100 per, uh, person per year. Uh, fracture risk, all cause mortality, 13 per 100 person years. Five year hospital admission, 32 per, percent per, year, per 100 person per year. Protonuria, 14 for percent person years. CKD, to approximately 20 per 100 person years, in the stage 0.5 per 100 person years. So a lot of comorbidities and mortality. Although I mention in details the outcome of acute kidney injury, but I like just to put it in your mind that acute kidney injury is not a simple phenomenon. It is very bad. This is why we should ask about the history of acute kidney injury for all nephrology cases. What is the definition? By the way, we changed the name from acute renal failure, not me, but the nephrologist. It changed the name because injury from psychological point of view is better to say to the patient that you have injury rather than failure. You know, failure is always bad. And the failure is one of the stages of acute kidney injury. So before 2003, if you go to the literature, you'll find different epidemiology, different incidence and prevalence. Why? Because the authors and uh, nephrologists used more than 30 operational definitions. Every group used a certain definition and different definition. This is why you find different statistics. After that, in Italy, acute kidney injury dialysis quality initiative uh, uh, led to the birth, birth of rifle was meant to buy rifle. R means risk, I means injury, F means failure, L means loss, E means end stage kidney disease. The rifle is based upon agreement between nephrologists and intensivists who meet together and lead to the birth of rifle. Depending upon either increased serum creatinine from the baseline, or reduction of glomerular filtration rate from the baseline values, or urine output criteria. So either to have GFR criteria or urine output criteria. If there is a discrimination or difference, suppose that you have a stage of risk based on GFR or creatinine and a stage injury based on urine output, we use the higher stage. So using this or that, and respecting the higher stage. Not to miss acute kidney injury. If we go up, this will be more sensitive. If we go down, it is less sensitive, but high specific. Let us discuss the definition one by one. To win to say risk, if there's increased creatinine by 1.5 fold or drop more than 25% of the baseline GFR, or urine output in this range, less than 0.5 milliliter per kg per hour for six hours. Suppose that you have a patient, 60 kilogram body weight, so 0.5 multiplied by 60 equal 30, by six uh, equal 180. So if six hour passed without 180 milliliter for a person uh, with body weight, six, 60 kilogram, this is stage of risk. 
then injury if after 12 hours we have the same value of urine less than 0.5 milliliter per kg per hour for 12 hour we, we are in injury if we take 60 kilogram an example so 360 milliliter urine was not evident after 12 hours so urine output is less than 360 milliliter within 12 hours this is a stage of injury or creatinine increased serum creatinine increased by twofold and less than threefold or reduction of glomerular filtration rate by 50 percent more than 50 to 75 percent reduction failure if there is increase of serum creatinine by threefold or GFR is reduced by 75% or serum creatinine enriches uh, or exceeds 4 milligram per deciliter. Or urine output is less than 0.3 milliliter per kg per hour for 12, 24 hours or complete anuria for 12 hours. So these are how we define uh, acute kidney injury. Then a failure persists for four weeks, it is stage of loss and beyond the three months, it uh, if persists, so we are now dealing with in the stage kidney disease or irreversible acute renal failure. This schema was evaluated and was associated with, with patient's mortality. So risk is associated with mortality, and the higher the stage of acute kidney injury, the higher the mortality more and more. Three years later. The uh, birth of Akin, acute kidney injury network classification by uh, in United States, they, the modification, uh, modifications are a reduction of the threshold. So the threshold of, for diagnosis is reduced from one point to five fold increasing creatine into just 0.3 milligram per deciliter. So if the baseline creatine 0.8 and now it is 1.1, this means increased by 0.3 milligram per deciliter, so we are in a stage of risk. So why they changed this definition? Just to improve the threshold and increase the sensitivity more and more. Or the same definition as rifle, creatine increased by 1.5 fold up to two fold of the baseline. They omitted GFR in, from the definition, and I like this because GFR is very dramatically changing and not like the base of chronic kidney disease. So it's better not to use GFR. They omitted as well loss and in the stage and they considered them as an outcome uh, in the point. So the, this is the major changes and urine output is the same. So this is the major changes, reducing the threshold by accepting 0.3 milligram per deciliter rise of serum creatinine and omitted the uh, loss and in the stage and as well as the GFR from the definitions. Again, Akin was associated with the outcome. The presence of stage one is associated with increased mortality. The higher the stage, the higher the mortality too. In 2012, more authors, internationals, who participated in the KDGO guidelines, kidney disease of improving global outcome, tried to unify the definition. So acute kidney injury is defined as one of the following, any one of the following. Either rise of creatinine by 0.3 milligram per deciliter, serum creatinine by 0.3, this is uh, like akin, but within 48 hours. Or 1.5 fold like rifle, but within seven days. So now we even become more precise. Or urine volume less than <coughs> 0.5 milliliter per kg per hour for six hours, like the breakfast definitions. So here they try to unify and emerge the two definitions. I advocate the use of any of these definitions. And uh, when we, we, we use AKI, KDU guidelines, we say according to AKI, KDU guidelines, because it will unify our approaches and our definition and our statistics between all nephrologists all over the world. So, uh, and here again, KDU had stage one, two, and three, and added the others into each group in the definition. So this is regarding the definition. What about the recovery? Is there any definitions for recovery? According to this proposal, the uh, AKI may recover early within 48 hours or delayed to uh, between two to seven days. 
or progressed either uh, to, to, from seven to 90 days in this uh, time range, we say acute kidney disease. And if it persists beyond 90 days, we are in chronic kidney disease. What are the risk factors and the etiology of acute kidney injury? I like this sector because risk factors are important for prevention. If we wanted to prevent any disease, we should know the risk factors. And in, even if there is no evidence-based studies uh, dealing with risk factors, it is uh, uh, needless to say it will reduce the occurrence of the problem. So risk factors for acute kidney injury include either patient's demographics or uh, doctor-related factors. So patient factors, all the age, as I mentioned in coronary kidney disease presentation, all the age is more prone to acute kidney injury because the capacity for regeneration is limited. Diabetes, liver failure, coronary kidney disease, this is the most important risk factor for acute kidney injury because the kidney has, uh, the power of regeneration is limited in the presence of coronary kidney disease like our case. So if you ask me which is the most important risk factor for acute kidney injury, it's the presence of pre-existing uh, chronic kidney disease. Atherosclerosis, renal artery stenosis, hyper and hypotension, hypercalcemia, hyperuricemia, sepsis. This is very, we should be smart. For all cases of acute kidney injury, we should search for infection. And in infection, we should monitor kidney function because both sepsis and acute kidney injury follow each other like the shadows. And when any of them is added to the other, they increase mortality more and more. A very operative cardiac dysfunction, so cardiac patients, rhabdomyolysis and tumor lysis disease are the demographics of the patients that put them in a higher risk for acute kidney injury. What are the doctor-related factors? Doctors used either medications or do operations. So medications. Non-steroidal, again, we don't like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And if we should use them, we should limit their dose and limit their duration. There is no superiority to cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors, COX-2 inhibitors, above COX-1 inhibitors for renal side effects. It may be advantageous to use COX-2 inhibitors for gastrointestinal and peptic ulcer, but for the kidney, because both COX-1 and COX-2 are normally present in renal tissue. Even immune suppressive drugs that are the cornerstone, calcineurin inhibitor cyclosporin or tacrolimus, are the cornerstone of immune suppressive drugs used in kidney transplantation. They are nephrotoxic. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, which are essential antihypertensive medications, especially if there is proteinuria. They as, as well are nephrotoxic, especially if they are not properly used. How to use them properly and wisely by knowing serum creatinine before their prescription and then to repeat serum creatinine after one to two weeks to show if there is any, to see if, in a, there, if any rise of creatinine occur. If there is any rise, then we should repeat and if the rise, if the maximum rise of creatine exceeds 30% of the baseline creatine, we should stop them. We are expecting that you may find some rise of creatine, but should be less than 30% of the baseline creatine. Be aware to start them carefully, to assess serum creatinine, and to repeat serum creatinine, and to manage, the, to stop them if there is uh, undue increase uh, if there is increased, uh, unexplained increase of uh, creatinine, uh, about uh, more than 30% of the baseline. Radio contrast, starch as volume expanders, we don't like them because they may lead to even acute kidney injury, aminoglycosides, amphotericin, uh, operations like cardiopulmonary bypass, very high risky, surgery involving aortic lamp, increased intraabdominal pressure, uh, large arterial. Uh, and the catheter uh, placement with risk of atherosclerosis, 
liver transplantation and kidney transplantation. All these are operations that are associated with increased risk of acute kidney injury. So it's better to put this checklist whenever we see the patient and just to say if there is any factor present to be very cautious about acute kidney injury. From Mayo Clinic proceeding, a very recent article showed the, uh, during the development cohort that cancer is associated with 2.7 fold increase in the risk of acute kidney injury, admission to medical unit, coagulopathy, heart failure, hypertension, vascular disease, pre existing renal disease, uh, increasing age, all these are associated with uh, increased risk of acute kidney injury. In the development cohort, baseline creatinine. Per one milligram per deciliter increase in creatinine, there is increased other ratio by 2.2 fold of occurrence of acute kidney injury and other medical hypertension, diabetes, and pre existing kidney disease. Be careful about the risk factors. What are the etiology and the causes of acute kidney injury? I like the simplicity. So, acute kidney injury causes may be pre renal affecting the kidney perfusion but with normal renal tubular, tubular structure, both under normal tubular structure, main lines, because I'm going to use this statement in the deficient diagnosis between pre-renal and intrinsic renal. So pre-renal means defective kidney perfusion. And I'm going to enumerate the causes of defective perfusion in the next slide. Post-renal means obstruction of the ureter by stones, by calculi. So uh, if we diagnose obstruction, that is associated with increased creatinine, we should refer the patient immediately to urologist for rapid interference and then to deal with the etiology later. So we have pre-renal, post-renal, and intrinsic renal. Renal, according to the structure of the kidney, glomeruli, tubules, interstitial blood vessel. We may have glomerulonephritis, tuberculosis, necrosis, interstitial nephritis, or vasculitis. Let us go to this table, which shows the differential diagnosis and the etiology and the classification and the causes. So pre-renal factors constitute 30% uh, percent, uh, to 60% percent of acute kidney injury. Volume depletion due to inappropriate use of diuretics or polyuria, gastrointestinal losses, or hemorrhage. Gastrointestinal loss like vomiting, diarrhea, hemorrhage, or even burn, Decrease the cardiac output, right or left side heart failure, cardiac tamponade. Systemic vasodilatation, I'm going to explain the difference in hemodynamics in different types of shock in one of the coming slides. Afferent arterial, arterial vasoconstriction, the use of medication on steroidal, calcineurin inhibitors, radiocontrast, hepaturenal syndrome, hypercalcemia, a lot of factors. Different arterial dilatation, like the famous drugs, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers. Post renal causes constitute 10% of the cases, either due to intrinsic causes of obstruction or extrinsic compression. Intrinsic, like bilateral ureteral stones, bladder outlet obstruction, prostate or blood clot, neurogenic bladder. Extrinsic like retroperitoneal fibrosis and metastatic cancer. So we should exclude from the beginning. Pre-renal to deal with pre-renal immediately will recover, will lead to re the rapid recovery of acute kidney injury. Post-renal, the same, will save the kidney. And then intrinsic, it is 40% of the causes, maybe acute injury or necrosis. Ischemic due to drug or pigment. Nephrotoxic drugs like aminoglycosides, lithium, amphetericin, and others. Nephrotoxic, like rhabdomyolysis, um, uh, pigments, like myoglobin from rhabdomyolysis, or hemoglobinuria from intravascular hemolysis. Acute interstitial nephritis due to drug use, infection, autoimmune diseases, or malignancy. And you can see the list here. Intratubular obstruction. Here you cannot see obstruction by ultrasound, no hydronephrosis, because it is intratubular, no dilatation in renal belfis due to baroproteins, immunoglobulin light chain, or crystals like acute phosphate nephropathy, tumor lysis syndrome, 
ايثيلين جلايكول اسايكلوفير اندونافير ميزوتوكسيد اكوت جلومينيفرايتس وات ايفر ذا كوز ماكرو فاسكولار لايك انكريز رينال فيم بريشر فروم انكريز انترا ابدومينال بريشر فولون سيرجري اند اف وي دايجنوز ات ات از بيتر تو ري اكسبلور ذا بيشنت اند وي كان دايجنوز انترا ابدومينال هايبرتنشن باي ميجرينج ذا رينال بلادر بريشر مايكرو فاسكولار لايك اثرو امبوليك رينال ديزيز هيموليتيك ريميك TTB, scleroderma, renal crisis, malignant hypertension. So this table is elegant to summarize the causes and the comments on each cause. Let me to review the hemodynamics associated with different types of shock. Why? Because if we understand the hemodynamics, we'll know why we select drugs for, uh, for each cause of uh, uh, shock to support the hemodynamic. We may have distributive shock, hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic obstructive shock. I'm going to discuss with you these three types. So in distributive shock, as you see, uh, vascular resistance, systemic vascular resistance is significantly reduced. This means vasodilatation. This is why we prefer vasoconstriction vasoconstrictor drugs here because cardiac output is high we don't need anotropes and we may give volume and in the same moment vasoconstrictors in sepsis neurogenic and anaphylaxis it is all these are examples of vasodilatory shock hypovolemic or hemorrhagic blood volume is significantly reduced systemic vascular resistance try to compensate so it is increased. We don't need vasoconstrictors here. Cardiac output is reduced. So we need to give fluids and we may think of anotropes later. So hemorrhagic, other volume depletion like diarrhea, vomiting, over diuresis, inadequate intake are beyond the causes of high volumic shock. Cardiogenic. In cardiogenic, there is increased preload, increased vascular resistance, but the most pronounced is reduction of cardiac output. This, this is why in cardiogenic shock, due to acute myocardial infarction, heart failure, we need ionotropic drugs that increase cardiac contractility. What is the fate? We have etiology for acute kidney injury. The fate is either toward recovery, blue line, or the red line, occurrence of consequences of chronic kidney disease. So the for recovery, we, uh, these are the axes of recovery, tubular epithelial cell regeneration, interstitial repair and regeneration, absence of fibrosis. But uh, if this uh, scenario is there, secondary glomerular sclerosis, glomerular hypertension, tubular interstitial fibrosis, endothelial mesenchymal transformation, endothelial damage, and the capillary dropout, arterial sclerosis, as you see, progression is the role. So if we uh, if, the, if this is the insult or the etiology, and then the patient follows the blue line, the ultimate is recovery. If uh, this is the etiology and the patient follows the red line, then the patient, the state will progress to chronic kidney disease. This is why again and again, we should ask about the history of acute kidney injury. How to diagnose? We have presentations. It may be uh, history and the manifestation of the cause. Oligoria, oligoric or non-oligoric acute renal failure, edema, hypertension, other body system symptoms, manifestations of complications. From early beginning of my career, when I was a medical student, we have a question in the, in the exam, write the management of acute renal failure. I, write, I wrote many pages about treating hyperkalemia and acidosis. So hyperkalemia is essential because it, in acute state may lead to cardiac arrest. So be careful. Uh, and if you order serum potassium to uh, look at uh, the value and deal with. If serum potassium is normal, ECG, we will find ECG normal in acute state. In acute uh, kidney injury, if it is between six to seven, you will find the hyperacute T or big T wave. Uh, seven to eight, you'll find the B wave is flattened. B behaves opposite to T. B is flattened, BR is prolonged, prolongation of QRS and the tall big DT wave. Uh, eight to nine, if you leave the patients, uh, more prolongation of QRS and further peaking of the wave, 
no B wave, uh, offline uh, sinusoid wave pattern, and the patient may die. So please, if you order serum potassium, look at it and deal with it carefully. He won't say acute renal failure or acute kidney injury. It is not the final diagnosis. We should know the etiology. We can know the etiology from the associated symptoms and investigations. Suppose that you have acute kidney injury plus hypercalcemia, hyperglycemia, bombin, and lytic lesion. Think of multiple myeloma. Uh, recent vascular intervention plus levido reticularis, peripheral uh, cyanosis, hypocomplementemia, ethylomoleculinal syndrome. By the way, after doing cannulation of the artery, the, if the case will be complicated by atherombolic renal disease, the embolism for the kidney, for the small kidney vessels take time. So there is latent period, at least one week, before rise of creatinine. This to discriminate between contrast, which occurs earlier, then atherombolic, which takes time. Then uh, we learned that from the early year of our medical school that if urine shows by dipstick post blood with no RBCs, red cells seen by a microscope, this is maybe due to myoglobin due to rhabdomyolysis or hemoglobin due to hemoglobinuria. So if you request CBK, creatine phosphokinase, CBK, and you find it very high, like here, so this is a case of rhabdomyolysis. Ultrasound is not an investigation for acute renal failure. It is uh, within the clinical examination. It is complementary to clinical examination because normal size kidneys is not palpable. So this is the normal ultrasound. A normal ultrasound, we should comment about size, echogenicity, differenti differentiation between cortex and the medulla, and the absence of hydronephrosis. Here, this is the capsule. Cortex is more gray in comparison to the liver and the medulla is more black in comparison to cortex because medulla includes pyramids. And then pelvis here, there is no hydronephrosis because pelvic fat are apparent as white color here, so there is no hydronephrosis. If there is obstruction, you'll find the pelvis is full of urine and the urine the ultrasound is black. So this is normal ultrasound. Compare it to this one, you'll find here black color here, so the uh, mild uh, back pressure with parenchymal thickness here is still preserved. This more and more, so it is moderate back pressure, moderate hydronephrosis. We don't like back pressure. We say hydronephrosis is better, uh, and the pelvis is well demarcated with the calcial system, and the kidney parenchyma is still there. If we don't deal with the patient in this stage, the outcome will very will be very bad. You will find the kidney is just back with no hope for recovery. So please search and deal with the obstruction. Ultrasound acute renal failure will find average size kidneys. You may find obstruction, uh, uh, but uh, small size kidneys is uh, 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 denoting chronic kidney disease. Here, urine examination. Urine examination is not an investigation. Urine analysis is the uh, liquid, consider the, the liquid biopsy of the kidney. And in acute kidney injury, it can help us to, uh, as a roadmap for the causes. So if you find normal or few red cells or few uh, white cells, this is pre-renal and, and the urine will, the osmolarity will be preserved. If there is red cell cast, this is glomerular nephritis. White cell cast, interstitial nephritis. Renal tubular epithelial cells or granular cast acute tubular necrosis. Isonephiloria, excessive isonephil, allergic interstitial nephritis or atherombolic renal disease. Crestaluria may be acute uric nephropathy, calcium oxalate, oxalate nephropathy, drugs or toxin like acyclovir, sulfa, diazine. Uh, so this is the broad roadmap. And you can find for each uh, list of differential diagnosis. So urine uh, examination help us, helps us to uh, uh, do the roadmap. In complementary to clinical examination, history, clinical examination, and the laboratory parameters and urine examination is uh, the indices. We have indices here from the serum, blood urea nitrogen in the serum, divided by serum creatinine. If it is very high, this refers to volume depletion. If it is within normal range uh, or less than 20, this is uh, uh, intrinsic renal. Then, as I mentioned, urine osmolarity here in perirenal or volume responsive uh, sector, 
you'll find those molarity is preserved. Kidney, renal tubules are normal, so they will concentrate urine in the case of dehydration. Renal, you'll find the urine is diluted because normal, it's not normal structure. The same, urinal sodium is conserved if the renal tubules are normal structure in very renal. So uh, urinary sodium is very low in very renal and high in acute necrosis because the kidney tubules cannot reabsorb sodium uh, well. Fraction excretion of sodium is calculated from this equation. It is less than 1%, so urinary and the serum sodium, urinary and serum creatinine, just to divide and multiply by 100%. If it's less than 1%, this is pre-renal. If it's above 1%, it is intrinsic renal. If the patient is treated with diuretics, then fraction excretion of sodium is not, is not uh, intelligent in this way. Uh, and the fraction excretion, excretion of urea is superior in these scenarios because usually we use diuretics that interfere with sodium but not with the urea. Uh, what about biomarkers? The ideal biomarker is easily measurable, reproducible, sensitive, organ-specific, cost-effective, easily interpretable, and present in readily available specimens like blood and urea. And I think there is no single test uh, ha has all these criteria. Why we are interested in biomarkers? Because we assume that serum creatinine is late to diagnose acute kidney injury. We, we want rapidly it changed uh, tests. So we are searching, always we are searching about biomarkers. We have functional, like serum creatinine, serum cystatin C, upregulated proteins like neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin, kidney injury molecule one, interleukin 18, urinary cystatin C, enzymes like all these enzymes. These are biomarkers. And as, as I mentioned, the advantages of biomarkers is to use them earlier for early detection of the problem because they are elevated very rapid uh, in comparison to the changes of serum creatinine. And they may help us to assess the risk and uh, to apply preventive strategy before the, uh, be, being late. Okay. Uh, I'd like to comment on the frisomide stress test. What this? It is like cardiac stress test. This functional test is meant uh, to further stratify patients at intermediate risk of acute kidney injury progression. The patient is given intravenous frisomide at the dose of one milligram per kg, if he, ha if he uh, ha is not treated with furosemide, this means furosemide naive, or 1.5 milligram per kg if previously treated with furosemide. If urine output is less than, less than 200 milliliter over next two hours, this, this, this results has 87% sensitivity and 84% specificity to predict the progression to stage three AKI. I like it because it even may refine a randomized control trial done in acute kidney injury. This is a list of biomarkers. This is example tissue inhibitor of metalloprotein uh, 2 and insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7. It is detected in urine, best at uh, AKI prediction in the ICU setting, uh, here, inegal may be done in the urine or the serum. Syst uh, systemic levels are elevated in sepsis and the severe inflammation, so the clinical use is limited in the adult ICU settings. Cystatin C, urine or serum. In serum, it is a marker of GFR. This is why we have formulas uh, to estimate GFR based on cystatin C. In urine, because it is normally absorbed and fully degraded in the proximal tubule, the presence of urinary cystatin C is a marker of tubular dysfunction. And because if it is degraded by the proximal convective tubule, we don't do cystatin clearance like what we do creatinine clearance based on 24 hour urine collection. Chem 1, kidney injury molecule 1, it is FDA approved for detection of drug-induced acute kidney injury in preclinical studies, uh, uh, unreliable in setting of inflammation. 
interleukin 18 hasn't been well evaluated. So this, this is the list of biomarkers and there are many other biomarkers. If you ask me, are they of clinical use? The answer is not yet. We are waiting until we have a parameter like troponin in the cardiology. We don't have it in the nephrology. This is why I consider all biomarkers in all renal diseases rather than the traditional ones like serum creatinine as investigational tool. I want to do biopsy. Biopsy is not done if we have pre-renal or acute necrosis or post-renal. And it is done if urine refers to glomerulonephritis or tubular interstitial nephritis, so the presence of red cell casts, white cell casts, and protonuria are indication with, with acute kidney injury are indications for biopsy to determine and refine immune suppressive drugs. If the cause is unexplained of acute kidney injury, if acute kidney injury is a component of systemic disease, if the course is prolonged, we give uh, two weeks for recovery or something like that, and there is no recovery, so we want to know uh, what is going on in the kidney. This is an example. This is the normal renal tubules, and these are tubular necrosis or tubular injury with dilatation and flattened epithelium. And here, this is the sign signal of regeneration. The most prone sites within the nephron for acute kidney injury are the active sites. S3 segment of proximal convective tubule and sick ascending limb of lobe finley are more prone to the damage. I I'd like to uh, just summarize what I mentioned in this uh, figure. So if you have elevated serum creatinine, assess the baseline. Is it coronary kidney disease? So we are dealing with coronary kidney disease. If it is not, and cope with the definition of acute kidney injury, uh, ultrasound, if there is obstruction, deal with obstruction. If there is no obstruction, review the history and the laboratory parameters. If there is renal cause, give fluid challenge and assess the response. If uh, there is no renal factors or no response to fluid challenge here, uh, then we both differential diagnosis according to the laboratory parameter and we may think of doing biopsy in the cases of glomerulonephritis and tubular interstitial nephritis. How to treat? Treatment is uh, uh, divided into two big categories. Supportive treatment, including dialysis, whenever indicated, and etiological treatment. Supportive treatment, one of the most important therapeutics is the fluid therapy. I want to answer two questions. What is the strategy of fluid replacement and which type of fluid to be used? The strategy is to start very adequate to replace the deficits. Uh, uh, adequately uh, from the starting point and then continue conservative according to, the, to urine output and insensible loss. Uh, and if you apply this, you will find here, this is the lowest strategy, the lowest mortality. So if you apply this strategy, you will save the life of the patient. But if you start adequate, then continue overdoing by giving liberal fluid, this will increase mortality. If you start inadequate and left the patient dehydrated until kidney structure damage, this will also increase mortality. If you start inadequate and continue liberal, this will increase mortality more and more because overload is an index of mortality. Don't forget, we want to replace the deficits immediately based on the patient situation and according to the strategy that we follow in the intensive care settings. And secondly, continue conservative after replenishment of the deficit. Which type of fluid? If there is hemorrhagic shock, get blood. If there is no hemorrhagic shock, crystalloids rather than colloids to be used. Colloids like albumin or starch are attractive as volume expander, but they are associated with problems, either cost, allergy, or even acute kidney injury with starch, with no beneficial effects uh, in, uh, to, uh, if compared to crystalloid. So crystalloids like isotonic chlor uh, saline, Ringer, uh, whatever the uh, physiological uh, crystalloids we use. So balanced, there is tendency to use balanced uh, fluids uh, if it is available. Isotonic chloride is, uh, in, in includes a lot of chloride and this can be complicated by hypercholeremic acidosis. And uh, a second point, Excessive chloride within isotonic saline in uh, reduce kidney perfusion. But 
isonic saline is the most available fluid, and sometimes uh, we cannot, uh, the other uh, uh, plasma lights or uh, ringer lactate, uh, either we cannot use them because of uh, electrolyte disturbance or they are not available. So use, which is available, crystalloids, and if you use sodium chloride, don't do the overdoing to avoid acidosis and kidney perfusion defect. It is not only fluid, but also hemodynamics. So we should be smart in using hemodynamic support. If we are dealing with septic shock, vasodilatory shock, as I mentioned in the hemodynamics, use vasoconstrictors. And I would like to share you our experience here at Urology and Nephrology Center in the ICU unit. In the past, we were consumed uh, by the dogma that noradrenaline will lead to renal vasoconstriction. That's why we didn't use it uh, in this old era. But when we changed our mind based on the research and studies and the change in treating the patients with septic shock in the ICU at Urology and Nephrology Center from dopamine and dopatrex to, vaso, to uh, vasoconstrictor noradrenaline, the outcome is significantly improved. Lower mortality and the lower incidence of acute kidney injury. Because don't forget sometimes pressure is better than water. Pressure means to support hemodynamic blood pressure may be superior to volume status. Again, optimizing volume therapy and, va and uh, the hemodynamics. And this is the application uh, that uh, application to the hemodynamic study. If you have problems in vasodilatation, use vasoconstrictors. Uh, vasoconstrictors are, div are divided into uh, bu uh, the pure vasoconstrictors with no enotropic effect that cannot increase cardiac contraction like phenylephrine, and vasoconstrictor with some inotropic effect like no epinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. So we use them nowadays in septic shock and the vasodilatory shock. Um, uh, and uh, if the patient is cardiac and suffering from cardiogenic shock, we need vasodilator to reduce afterload. And in the same moment, we, we need drug that improve the contraction of the heart. So dobutamine uh, is the best drug to be used. This is based upon understanding of the hemodynamics of the patients. What about diuretics? Why, when I was a medical student, the first treatment is mannitol for acute renal failure. Nowadays, it is obsolete to use mannitol in acute renal failure. And here the KDU guidelines recommending not using diuretics to prevent and suggesting not using them to treat acute kidney injury, except in the management of volume overload and not to postpone dialysis because of the presence of overload, okay? So diuretics is out of favor nowadays. These are the list of drugs that were tested and we are expecting that it may change the outcome. Unfortunately, uh, there is nothing uh, to improve the outcome. So we don't like dopamine. The, there is nothing called the dopamine renal dose that we are uh, accustomed to use in the past. Uh, so dopamine of no value. Phenylidopamine is limited, needs further studies. All these drugs, except uh, norabinephrine and septic shock, uh, need further assessment, and there is uh, no added benefit. This slide carries some hope. This is the mortality in stage one, two, and three acute kidney injury. If we properly treat hyperkalemia, mortality is reduced in all stages. If we properly monitor and treat hyperkalemia and metabolic acidosis, mortality is reduced more and more. If we combine proper management of hyperkalemia, metabolic acidosis, and volume status, mortality is reduced. This means that supportive treatment of the patient, proper monitoring of the patient is of critical value and make a great difference supporting the patient until recovery. Now, who went to do dialysis? We have two schools, either doing dialysis earlier in a stage three rifle or a keen or kidigo, but there is no support. I'm not supporting this theory at all. And KIDU guidelines support critical indications as indication of dialysis because we need to do access, use machines, and you want solid evidence. So the, what we do is if there is critical indication, volume overload, severe hyperkalemia, uh, severe acidosis, and encephalopathy, all these are a straight indications for, for starting dialysis in acute renal failure settings. 
if we will do blood uh, purification, so hemodialysis, we need access. So vascular access of according to the order of choice, we start with right jugular vein Y because it is in direct continuity with superior vena cava, followed by femoral vein, then left jugular vein because it is a very long course, and then the last choice is subclavian vein. Why subclavian vein is the last resort? Because it is associated subclavian vein by its default is more susceptible to subclavian vein stenosis and the central vein stenosis. Be careful. Which modality to be used according to the preference and according to the facilities and according to your patient. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we need continuous renal replacement therapy or slow low efficiency dialysis. If he is hemodynamically stable, we can do intermittent hemodialysis. Uh, so we have, according to the technique, we have hemofiltration, hemodialysis, and hemodiafiltration. And here this is extended, prolonged intermittent renal replacement therapy, slower, uh, if, uh, and here more and more slower continuous replacement therapy with very slow efficiency to cope with the hemodynamic compromise in hypotensive patients. CVVH, continuous venous hemofiltration, continuous venous hemodialysis, continuous venous hemodiafiltration. And the uh, explanation of the techniques and the mechanisms are beyond the stock. We may use peritoneal dialysis, so either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis, but uh, be careful because peritoneal dialysis is not an efficient modality. If the patient has hypercatabolic process, you will need hemodialysis rather than peritoneal dialysis. Special situation. This is the era of COVID-19. Always nowadays we are in a very catastrophic pandemic of COVID-19. Everything is restricted and we are restricted. We are staying home. And this, is, uh, this was our video of Egyptian Sotic Infusion and Transplantation uh, that was recorded on 28th of March about COVID-19 and uh, kidney. And within this video, you'll find the sector of acute kidney injury. So acute kidney injury ranges between 0.5 to 23%. And the patient will need CRRT in, from 0.8 to 9%. And the cause postulated mechanisms of acute kidney injury are due to sepsis uh, leading to cytokine storm or direct cellular injury to the due to the virus, maybe. So the, these are the pathogenesis. I, I would like to stress upon what I mentioned in the beginning. If the patient has baseline increase the serum creatine as a red line here, red curve, the Cumulative instance of acute kidney injury increases significantly. So again, presence of high based creatinine is a real risk factor for uh, acute kidney injury in COVID-19. Secondly, the presence of acute kidney injury with COVID-19 is bad news. Why? Because the cumulative death rate increases significantly with acute kidney injury. How to treat uh, critically ill adults with COVID-19? This is the guidelines you can go through. 104 pages, but uh, I'd like just to see a few words about diuretics. We may use diuretics just to give a time uh, to avoid the uh, dialysis as we can because we are afraid of spread of infection. Uh, fluid therapy uh, uh, to be conservative rather than liberal. We don't like to overload the patient. And the crystalloid, as I mentioned in the common AKI is the preferred, and the balanced electrolyte is superior to the isotonic saline. All these are the recommendations. Doing dialysis, CRRT may be preferred because it is done in the ICU, in the critical ill patients, and instead of moving the patient to dialysis unit because we are afraid of infection. Whenever dialysis is done, uh, the best is to be done in area with negative air to avoid dissemination of infection. And all personnel, and this is the most important point, patients and the personnel uh, carry the pro uh, pro protective equipment to face this infection. Antimicrobials. Antimicrobial can affect any part of the nephron. Glomeruli, and these are the events, proximal tubule, or collecting ducts. And this table shows the list of drugs like antiviral, antibiotic, antifungal. The, uh, their mechanisms of uh, nephrotoxicity, 
and the clinical manifestations of this toxicity, either acute necrosis, intestinal nephritis, or electrolyte disturbance. Be careful about the use of medication. What about calcium channel blockers and some antibiotics? If the patient is treated with antihypertensive calcium channel blockers, be careful about the use of calorithromycin. Why? Because calorithromycin reduces the metabolism of uh, the majority of calcium channel blockers that may lead to hypotension and mortality. Be careful. If we need calorithromycin, we may replace it by adithromycin uh, in the presence of calcium channel blockers. What is the strategy to prevent nephrotoxicity of antimicrobials? We have six points strategy. This is a very nice strategy, very simple. To know the creatine clearance or estimated GFR based dose adjustment, so we should modify medications according to renal function. Uh, when available, do the blood level for the antimicrobial like vancomycin blood level uh, and others, because vancomycin, high vancomycin level is associated with many kidney dysfunction, including even vancomycin cast nephropathy. Adequate and appropriate hydration during antibiotic therapy because dehydration will be a second threat for the, with the presence of antibiotics. Avoidance of concomitant nephrotoxic and avoid them as possible, stop non diuretics if we can. Daily assess the antibiotic indications and the use of short antibiotic courses whenever possible. All these are critical points. We should, have, we should review the medications because with revision of medication, we can stop or shorten unnecessary medication. If long-term antibiotic is required, regular and periodic assessment of kidney function. Please don't forget these six points which helped us uh, for uh, containment of the problem of nephrotoxicity. Elderly persons are more support, uh, exposed to uh, kidney dysfunction because the uh, treatment of elderly patients is based on polypharmacy. The multiplicity of the drugs, the more, the more the drug we use, the more the complication we expect. So if you use non steroidal that uh, uh, decrease prostaglandin and diuretics that reduce blood volume, this will increase renal ischemia. The same diuretic and RAS inhibitor, and it may be more if we use the three drug together, so renal ischemia is there. If you use calerithromycin, as I just mentioned, with calcium shine blockers, you will inhibit calcium shine blocker metabolism, leading to hypotension. So renal ischemia may be due to multiplicity of drugs used. Or increase the risk of statin-induced rhabdomyolysis. If statin used with calerithromycin or with cyclosporin, cyclosporin inhibit the statin metabolism of simvastatin, and even atorvastatin, they're limiting dose, the, the, the dose of atorvastatin or cyclosporin is just 10 milligram. Don't increase the dose above 10 milligram of atorvastatin because uh, the cyclosporin inhibits statin metabolism that may lead to rhabdomyolysis. Increase the drug nephrotoxicity by combination of these drugs or these drugs and uh, uh, vancomycin plus bibracillin Tazobactam, what happens if we combine this antibiotics? Bibracillin and Tazobactam decrease the vancomycin clearance, and this will increase vancomycin concentration and will increase nephrotoxicity. Be careful whenever you use multiple medication. What about anticoagulation? If this patient is treated with warfarin and he has baseline chronic kidney disease and INR is uh, four, and then presents with acute kidney injury, uh, and warfarin is, is, is replaced by heparin until INR become normalized and the biopsy was done. What do you see? This is the bleeding in the renal tubules and in the Bowman capsule, uh, Bowman space. So this is a case of anticoagulation related nephropathy. So this is the term. Whenever we use anticoagulation, it is better not only to monitor INR for warfarin, but as well to monitor kidney function. And this is the rate of frequency for monitoring of kidney function according to the level of GFR that we have. Even for, for direct oral anticoagulant, which is not dependent upon INR, please repeat measurement of uh, kidney function uh, to pick up early kidney dysfunction. And if you use warfarin, warfarin, please don't exceed INR3 in patient with CKD. This is the list of warfarin-induced nephropathy risk related risk factors. INR above three, presence of chronic kidney disease, 
diabetes, hypertension, old age, all these are risk factors. And we, we should suspect and confirm the diagnosis. Suspect whenever there is a hematuria combined with acute kidney injury with worsening of a known coronary kidney disease with in a patient treated with warfarin and INR exceeding three, no, no record of acute hemorrhage, exclude other causes of acute kidney injury. Confirm by presence of uh, this morphic erythrocyte in Bowman space, as I mentioned, as I demonstrated in the, in the pathology slide. Then ex extensive erythrocyte cast formation in the distant lymph node segments, acute, acute tubule cell injury with intracet blood tubular ferric hemocidrine deposit, absence of endocabillary or extracabillary proliferation, uh, other cause of AKI is uh, excluded. So this is how we deal with this scenario. Even in cancer patients, cancer patients are more prone to kidney dysfunction, either because of cancer or because of the therapeutics. And this is how the chemotherapy-induced kidney injuries, uh, they work on all nephron segments. So you can have thrombotic macroangiopathy, uh, nephrotic syndrome, tubulopathies, acute interstitial nephritis, renal cyst, crystal deposition, uh, etc. I would like just to some uh, to give some uh, highlights to the immunotherapy or checkpoint inhibitors. This are relatively new classes of anti-cancer drugs for treating the, the devastating malignancies like melanoma or non-small cell lung cancer. Just uh, to give the way, we have lymphocytes and we have antigen presenting cells. Uh, uh, lymphocytes here has accessories to bind to certain ligand. So cancer through antigen present cells can uh, present ligand like program death ligand one. A program death ligand one binds to its receptor on the lymphocyte, which is BD1 from its name program death. The lymphocyte will be exhausted and inhibited. And when lymphocytes are inhibited, cancer will grow and flourish. Two correct this defect and to combat malignancy, we would like to stimulate lymphocyte again. How to stimulate lymphocyte is by inhibiting program this one, by this drug like nivolumab or the ligand. So by this way, we inhibit the exhaustive pathway. T lymphocyte will be stimulated and it can eat cancer. The same on the T lymphocytes and antigen present cell, there is co-stimulation uh, molecule. If co-stimulation molecule is attached, this will strengthen immune response. But the problem, we have co-inhibitory molecules. So CTLA-4 may be ex ex exaggerated. That can lead to inhibition of the immune response. To normalize this, to combat cancer, we can inhibit CTLA-4 by anti-CTLA-4, this drug. By this way, T lymphocyte will be stimulated, activated, and kill the malignancy. So this is the mechanism, very beautiful. What, should, what is the problem? The problem, we are stimulating immunity. What's the problem of stimulating immunity? This may lead to many problems, not only in transplanted patients, but in naive patients. Uh, this can lead to acute kidney injury. Based on this cohort of patients, 1,000 patients who had cancer and treated with checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapy, uh, the, this is the rate of acute kidney injury, and this is a checkpoint uh, related acute kidney injury. Proton bump inhibitor increases the risk of acute kidney injury, and the conclusion of this uh, uh, paper, AKI is common in patients receiving checkpoint inhibitors, and the causes are heterogeneous. Proton bump inhibitor therapy is a risk factor for sustained acute kidney injury. This is why we should avoid them if we can or limit their dose. Suppose that we have acute kidney injury with checkpoint inhibitor. Do we stop them or continue them? Or we can use a small dose of steroid. I think this, uh, this needs another talk, uh, not, and this talk is not uh, dedicated for this. Let us go to our case. An old ma uh, uh, gentleman who has prolonged type 2 diabetes and hypertension, all these are risk factors for comorbidities. Baseline creatine 2.7, this is very low. Uh, GFR, uh, 25 milliliter per minute stage four coronary kidney disease. So this is the most respected risk factor for occurrence of acute 
kidney injury because one has pre-existing severe coronary kidney disease. After BCI, this is a contrast through the uh, coronary angio and the stenting, uh, he became uh, acute kidney injury. So this is contrast associated acute kidney injury. Why contrast? Because it occurs within uh, in close temporal rela relationship for the use of contrast media. If there is delayed period, more than one week, we can uh, think of atherioembolic renal disease or other causes. L I like the topic of contrast. Nowadays, it is contrast associated. In the past, it was contrast, contrast induced. And in 2012, I had these three YouTube videos. And by these three videos, we started the ECNT Virtual Academy. Definition, classification, and clinical presentation, and another video for risk factor and prognosis and prevention. I like it. But the definition is very simple. Contrast associated acute kidney injury is defined as a rise of creatine. Usually we use 0.5 milligram per deciliter rise of creatine as an absolute value. After I donated contrast exposure, provided that there is no uh, other alternative etiology. And this rise occurs uh, within hours or one to two days after the contrast and reach its peak within three or five days and recover in the majority of the cases or be followed by consequences. Risk factors include age, diabetes, CKD, and contrast dose. This is a very nice article showing the type of ionic contrast. Nowadays, we don't use high osmolality or low osmolar ionic. We use either isoosmolar, non-ionic, or, uh, uh, or uh, here, non-ionic dimer or monomer, so iso or low osmolar, non-ionic. These are the two types that can be used. Uh, what are the risk factors for contrast associated acute kidney injury? There are patient-related factors and procedure-related factors. Patient-related factors is estimated GFR less than 30. This is the highest risk for either IV or intraarterial contrast media. Intravenous like CT, intraarterial like coronary angio. If estimated GFR is less than 45, contrast is uh, harmful for intraarterial procedures, so be careful. Risk factors for impaired renal function in general are not specific to contrast associated acute kidney injury, old age, female, low body mass index, cardiovascular, malignancy, inflammation, bleeding, anemia, hyperuricemia. So we should go to the checklist to, to see the comorbidities. The most important is procedure related, repeated contrast. We should avoid this bad habit by requesting a lot of CT with contrast in unnecessary. This is very bad habit to be avoided. High contrast media dose, and this is how the ratio is calculated. But I have, in my mind, a simple uh, calculator. If the body weight is, uh, for example, 60 kilograms, multiply 60 by 5, this means 300. To be divided by serum creatinine. If serum creatinine is 2, this means 150. If 3, it is means 100. What is this? It is the maximum and not the standard, not the dose. We shouldn't reach this dose. If you reach this dose or exceed it, this is a real risk factor for the problem, even if you use the best contrast you have. So limit as you can. Use the, the minimum dose, uh, which is sufficient for your procedure, and uh, be careful. Uh, regarding CT scan, if estimated GFR less than 30, yes, intravenous uh, ionated contrast with CT scan is risky for contrast associated acute kidney injury. But if the estimated GFR between 30 to 44, we depend upon the comorbidities and the use of intravenous uh, ionic contrast is not risky in this scenario, but we should limit the multiplicity of, uh, of the use, frequency of the use, and the dose. It is needless to do that. Why contrast is bad? Because of viscosity, because of osmolality, because of cellular damage and many pathways. I'm not going to bother you by this, but I want to concentrate. Determine the risk of acute kidney injury. Uh, baseline risk factors uh, use risk prediction tool. We should learn this. Uh, this is an education. We have a lot of tools that we can have and you can download from Google. Just write the risk for contrast and you'll find checklist just to fill in space. If the patient is in low risk, Use low osmolar or isoosmolar, as I mentioned, non-ionic contrast. Consider suspending nephrotoxic medications. That's all. And avoid dehydration. If the patient is a high risk, 
use low osmolar or iso osmolar minimum dose of the contrast suspend nephrotoxic drug administered intravenous isotonic sal saline in the since a couple of years we were in debate is isotonic bicarb superior and there there was a trend about isotonic bicarb and we prepare it because the bicarb that we have is hypertonic nowadays i'm happy because isotonic saline is the only recommended because there is no advantage of uh, it was proven from trial that isotonic bicarb add nothing to isotonic chloride isotonic sodium chloride so isotonic sodium chloride and perform a follow up of the kidney function this is a very nice algorithm if gfr is above 60 for intra-arterial administration or more than uh, 45 milliliter per minute for intravenous okay no further measures required except avoiding dehydration and avoiding fasting this is a bad habit to say to the patient who will go for ct scan you should be fasting for the night yes you can fast from food but uh, for water no fasting no absolute fasting for because this will increase the hydration if it's major fast less than 60 for arterial or 45 for intravenous and i think this is a more cautious algorithm here Hydration was isotonic saline, three milliliter per kg per hour for one hour, then followed by one milliliter per kg per hour for six hours. I think it's very appreciated and simpler than what we do because always we do this, one milliliter per kg per hour for 12 hours before and after elective procedures. So this uh, one is best fitting for uh, emergent procedure like coronary angio. If, and then drug to stop 48 hours before and to reassess 40 hours after the contrast include non-steroidal metformin. Why metformin is restricted here? Because we are afraid of the higher risk of acute kidney injury. If acute kidney injury occurs, this may increase the risk of lactic acidosis uh, with the use of metformin. So should uh, just to stop metformin until we are sure that nothing, no acute kidney injury. Diuretic of visible, uh, the, the, there is a debate of the ACE inhibitor arm. Avoid adrenaline contrast for the next 72 hours. So uh, we should space maneuvers as we can and not do unnecessary repeated procedures. I would like to prepare to end the presentation by a few slides. Is acute kidney injury isolated renal disease or there is a crosstalk between acute kidney injury and the different body systems? The answer is yes, there is crosstalk. As you see here, acute kidney injury with disturbance of all these inflammation, oxidative stress, electrolyte, and acid based distur disturbance can affect the brain, leading to uremic encephalopathy, heart, heart failure, cardiac syndrome, uh, the lung, uh, acute lung injury, uh, liver, acute hepatic injury, intestine, gut, uh, altered gut microbiota, inflammation. So we should be careful. Acute kidney injury is not an isolated disease. This stimulated us. A uh, few years ago, to uh, run uh, an experiment with medical students because at Merck we had the ischemia reversion injury model, and this is a model of acute kidney injury. We have many publications. So, this is two students with uh, the team. Uh, they worked on the brain, so they created the ischemia reversion injury of the kidneys and then tested the brain and they found excessive toll like receptor 4. This makes does it explain encephalopathy? We don't know, and it needs further testing. Uh, another uh, other two students here uh, worked on the pancreas. Here was Dr. Salam, and here was Dr. Abaz Hussein Abdul Aziz, uh, Abaz Hussein. Uh, pancreatic injury second to renal ischemia perfusion. So they, what they did, ischemia perfusion injury of the rat, and then assessing pancreas by histology, they find insulitis. And it was very fantastic to publish this work from medical students. Shrif Shower is a medical is a medical was medical student in the first batch of Mansoura Manchester Medical Program. I love him so much because he has a smart mind. Sharif, uh, through catching the rat in a professional way, created the ischemia reversion injury of the rat, and then he came to me by idea. He found from the literature that acute kidney injury is more damaging in males than females. And I asked him, why? What's what are you thinking? He said to me, estrogen in females is beneficial to the kidney. I said to him, why the contrary? Why not the contrary? Why testosterone is not bad? Testosterone may be the bad hormone. 
So we did the experiment by doing orchidectomy and orchidectomy and giving medications. And he mastered the technique of orchidectomy and he proved in his experiment that was uh, presented in one of international conferences. And he uh, went, the, uh, he uh, had the prize uh, of the session. Uh, he proved that the castration ameliorates histopathology of skin barrier perfusion injury. This, uh, irrespective to the experiment and the conclusion, uh, Sharif mastered the technique of orchidectomy and orchidectomy in rats to the extent that he participated in training of his colleagues while he was in semester 11 and 12. He trained his colleagues in semester 10 about orchidectomy and orchidectomy in rats in Merck while he was a student. I know now, he, I think he finished his residency uh, at U, in UK, and I'm happy that uh, he will progress more and more. These are the two students of two like receptor four of the brain, and these are the two students of sepsis induced acute kidney injury. I would like to finish the presentation by the uh, few statements. We need uh, to improve the quality of care of the patients toward the quality improvement goals. And for quality, we should work in the community. We work in the hospital to prevent and always prevent because prevention is better than cure. And if I could get injury there to diagnose it in the early beginning and do the best replacement therapy whenever indicated, by this way, we improve the treatment, the prevention and, and the treatment. So these are the axes working in the community, in the hospital, management in the hospital of FKI, using the proper renal replacement therapy, acute kidney injury, uh, following the patients after the acute kidney injury, always working in a cycle to improve our care. To apply what's meant by uh, 4M, medication adjustment, minimize exposure, message care team, and the patient monitor the patient after acute kidney injury. This is the, our AS in the Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation Virtual Academy. I'm honored to be the executive director of this site. Just go to, uh, to this browser and create your account and you can download anything. If you write, I could get an injury in the index, you'll find the 53 lectures, 77 videos. And the last statement I would like to see, medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability. This is why we should read and do research. If we stop reading, if we stop to be students, we will die. A doctor is a student till his death. This is a fact, and we should believe in it. When, when we would want to believe in it, we, the doctor inside us die. And just to show you, the, this is even hepatitis syndrome is changing. In this presentation, I didn't cover everything about acute kidney injury. There are cardiorenal, hepaturinal, sepsis associated acute kidney injury. So acute kidney injury is a very wide spectrum encountered in all specialities. This is why it's better to educate other specialists to prevent acute kidney injury. And even some countries have fantastic alert system. If there is inner rise of creatine and new rise of creatine, there is alerts through the mobile to, and even bringing the nephrology consultation for the patients to pick up the disease. So a lot of issues can be done to uh, reduce this uh, problem that's associated with mortality. And uh, by this way, uh, at this point, I should stop speaking. Thank you very much for your attention. Hoping that uh, you'll find it is satisfactory. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to send to my email, drhattia.com. Thank you, have a nice day and goodbye.